Chiefs running back Damian Williams has opted out. Patrick Mahomes is the fourth best player in the NFL, and look who's getting the ball for the Royals home opener on Friday. All of these topics are covered by the beat writers on Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Thursday, July 30th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. First, we'll hear from Herbie Teopia on how the Chiefs are going to cover Damian Williams' decision not to play this season because of COVID-19. Williams joins a growing list of NFL players taking this path. We also talk about Mahomes' ranking as the fourth best player in the NFL, and Herbie explains the process. This ranking makes a little more sense when you hear this. After a break, Royals beat writer Lynn Worthy checks in from the road. He's in Detroit to cover the final game of the Royals' season opening road trip before the team returns for its home opener on Friday. We talk about the team's surprise starting pitcher for that game, second-year pro Chris Bubich, and we talk about what's been to like and not like about the Royals' start to this season. But first, here's Herbie Teope on the Chiefs. Hey, Herbie, were you as surprised by the news of Damian Williams as most people seem to have been? Yeah, I will tell you this. I, I, I kind of figured, that, you know, when you look around the NFL, there are a lot of players who are now taking the, you know, going that route of the voluntary opt-out. Obviously, Laurent Duvernay-Tardy kicked it off. He was the first NFL player, first Chiefs player. But then on on Tuesday, we or yeah, excuse me, Wednesday, we saw a lot of players around the league, including some big name players. Patrick Chung, the safety from the Patriots, Nate Solder uh, from the New York Giants, uh, one of the elite left tackles. Damian Williams surprised me. I, I I didn't, you know, I kind of figured again that another Chief would do it. I just didn't think it would be him. And, and we don't know the reason. We we don't know if. Um... Uh, if there was some family reason. The only hint that we have was the release that the Chiefs put out with a Brett Veach quote that said, you know, we're, you know, we just wish him and his family well. So you wonder if there is some family issue here, but we just, we just don't know. But you're right. They, this is a trend now, and I'm, I'm, I'm don't think we've seen the last of this. We're starting actually to see it in college football too. There was a you know, a Virginia Tech player, a uh, guy who's an NFL prospect, said he was opting out on this season. So I don't know. The, the, for the Chiefs, it was, a, again, a surprise. Let's let's talk about what Damian Williams has meant to this offense the last couple of years. Uh, my, my, my first impression is during the regular season, a little bit, during the postseason, quite a lot. Oh, yeah. He's 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 um. The NFL's version of Mr. October, and of course now we're, I'm showing my age and you get that reference, but for all yep. the youngins out there, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about Reggie Jackson um, from the 70s and 80s. Mr. October, he, he always came through in the postseason, and and that's what Damian Williams did. Think about this, man. I mean, in the three games in the postseason the, the, last year when, when the Chiefs made that path to the Super Bowl, 291 291- total yards 196 rushing and six touchdowns in three games and that included the 133 total yards and two touchdowns in the Super Bowl win against the San Francisco 49ers he only had 498 yards rushing during the season but he also missed five games and it's it's kind of weird when you think about this the 498 yards rushing led the team so he he obviously means a lot to the offense but certainly you're going to miss his presence during the postseason if this past postseason and the year before are any indication there, there are some people who thought he should have been the Super Bowl MVP because of <clears throat> because of that performance and keep in mind he he scored the Chiefs last two touchdowns right on the the reception the the short pass from Mahomes that he stuck the ball out over the pylon and then the the clinching uh touchdown the the thir- I think it was the 38 yard run with about a minute to go that clinched so he had the final two touchdowns in the Super Bowl, over 100 yards rushing, and and you're right, 498 rushing during the regular season led the team, and he two of those runs were a, a 91 yarder against the Vikings and an 84 yarder against the Chargers. So you know 170 yards of his 490 came on two carries. So it says a couple things, right? That that it wasn't a um, you know a, a run dominant Chiefs offense as it hasn't been since. Well, for a long time, but but also, but also, each of the last two years, Damian Williams is, is really you know he's competed to be the feature back. Two years ago, 
Uh, Kareem Hunt entered the season as a starter, you know, was kicked off the team after nine or ten games. Spencer Ware took over for a handful of games. He got hurt. And then it was Damian Williams that took over the last three games of the 2018 regular season. And then he had two really, really good games in the playoffs against the Colts and the Patriots. And last year, LaShawn McCoy was sharing feature back you know, responsibility with Damian Williams. Uh, LaShawn ended up with like 460 yards rushing. So he, he didn't either, neither one of these regular seasons with the chiefs was he a, like a, a pro bowl quality back, but man, when it came to, when it came to the playoff games, five playoff games, he was just fantastic. He has 10 total touchdowns in the playoffs, which is a, which is a chief's record. So, what, where do the Chiefs go from here at running back? I, I think uh, a lot of people are saying Andy Reid was in the Chiefs were pretty shrewd when it came to the end, when it came to the draft this year. Yeah, that first round selection of rookie Clyde edwards helaire out of LSU really truly looms large right now, and, and you got to expect that he will be the guy that they're going to lean on immediately. When you think of the, the current death chart right now, you've got edwards helaire Darwin Thompson. Daryl Williams, DeAndre Washington, and Elijah McGuire, who spent time on the practice squad last year. But of that group, who gives you the most explosiveness out of the backfield? And it's got to be that rookie, Edwards Allaire. I like the fact that when we talked to him last week, he had mentioned, and, and our, our colleague Sam McDowell uh, wrote, wrote up a story on him, or excuse me, our intern, Andrew Golden, wrote up a story yeah, on him. Andrew did. Um, how he's grasped the playbook, how he's used this offseason, despite all the challenges, how he's he's grasping the playbook. But the thing that really jumps out to me is he spent time with Patrick Mahomes working out and training. And, and I think that's not only going to help him as a running back, but also as a receiver out of the backfield because quarterbacks have to have that chemistry with a receiver. And that, that's going to help this game, or excuse me, the Chiefs offense out immensely. Hey, so when the when the Chiefs lost um, Laurent Duvernay Tardif for uh, for the opt out, uh, within a couple of days we saw them sign uh, Kalichi Assemble. Do, do you think the Chiefs reach out and and uh, and find a running back here? I don't think so for one main reason because the teams have to be at eighty players before the first padded practice. Remember, don't let's keep in right. mind. Um, just last week, the NFL and NFLPA made an adjustment to the CBA because of COVID-19 and how they're going to handle the training camp rosters. Teams had two options. They could keep 90 players now, but by by their first padded practice, which for the Chiefs, we don't have a schedule, but when you look at the calendar, it projects as August the 14th. So by then, they have to be at 80 players. Right now, by my count, they're at 81, which includes all the cuts they made yesterday. Uh they have to make a corresponding roster move because they agreed the terms with veteran safety Tedrick Thompson. I think Andy Reid and what what's going on right now with COVID and knowing that you have to hit the regular season with players that you know, as opposed to the unknown, they're probably content with what they have. You know, of course, anything can and will happen. They might decide that, hey, we do need a running back. But as of right now, because they're close to 80 players, I can't see that happening right now. Okay. Hey, so let me ask you this question. I, I wondered about this. Um, later in the show, we're going to talk to Lynn Worthy, who covers the Royals. And, of course, the Royals have had their their share of dealing with the, the COVID-19. And um, in, in baseball, they've gone through the opt-outs as well. And and now we're, we're seeing it in football. In baseball, players who, who, who have opted out can come back in. That's not the case with football in the NFL, right? Once you've opted out, you're you're done for the season. Am I correct on that? That is correct. And, and the key thing here is for the players, their contract, like, for example, Damian Williams, this would have been his final year of his deal because the Chiefs exercised an option on him. Uh, Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, this would have been the final year of his deal. But both of those players are not playing. So with the, the new agreement the, under the CBA with the NFL and NFLPA, their contracts roll over to next year. So they're not like some people are saying, oh, they're finished with the Chiefs because this was the last year. No, they're going to be like as if they, they didn't play because they will not accrue a season this year. So essentially they're signed through 2021. Correct. OK. Hey, and you mentioned uh, Tedder Thompson just a moment ago, the safety uh, Chiefs picked him up. What was uh, what do you think the rationale was behind uh, signing him? Um, and, and here's the key thing. And, and even though I know Juan Thornhill and, and has been working out. He's posting photos on his Twitter page and also Instagram. And 
Andy Reid um, during earlier in the offseason said, hey, he's on track. I, I think this is a depth move because Tedrick Thompson can play free safety. Uh, the Chiefs are set at strong safety with Tyron Matthew, but they need the depth behind Juan Thornhill just in case he's not ready to go full go when they go to padded practices. So I think this is a good move because you, you've got a player who understands you know, he, he's played three years up in Seattle. So he's a veteran who gives you starter ability because he started 16 games over the past two years. Durability, though, with this guy is a concern because he's also missed quite a few games. But if he's healthy, he gives you depth. Gotcha. Okay, let's uh, let's wrap this up with the final observation here of you know the Damian William news, uh, Williams news came down on uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon, and that was of course the big chief story until the evening when it was revealed that in the <laughs> NFL's top hundred rankings, Patrick Mahomes came in fourth. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what what a what a social media firestorm that created. All of a sudden. You know, for the second straight day, Patrick Mahomes is trending on Twitter. The previous day, of course, was because he, he, um, you know, get, get gained the ownership stake in the Kansas City Royals, and, for, and this time it's it's for his ranking on the NFL's top 100. Look, um, rankings are silly, uh, but they're very interesting. We all we are partake in them. I've, I've been a top 25 college football voter, college basketball voter, almost my entire life. Those are silly, but they. They exist because people are interested in them, and people were interested in the NFL's top 100. So, um, did you follow any of the the social media hubbub over this? And what did you make of it? <laughs> here's here's what people need to understand about the top 100 list because it the voting process actually starts during the regular season, and players are given ballots throughout the season, and they collect them at the end of the year. So. The voting process happened without the benefit of watching Patrick Mahomes' magical postseason run. During the regular season of 2019, there was another quarterback, and he, coincidentally he finished number one, who was taking the league by storm. And, I'm, and obviously we're talking about Lamar Jackson. So it didn't surprise me when he made number one because people are going to go with the known. The players are human. They're going to go with what's being out there right now. Patrick Mahomes' name never came up during the 2019 regular season as an MVP because – Lamar Jackson was doing his thing. So it did not surprise me, but you're absolutely correct about lists. Take it with a grain of salt. We, we know Patrick Mahomes is not the fourth best player in the NFL. He's <laughs> arguably number one. But also understand the voting process. It happened during the regular season. And if you're in a locker room, sometimes you'll see personnel from the NFL collecting ballots. And that's when it, that's when it happens. That's a great point, Herbie. I don't, I'm not sure how much that's understood, that it happens during the regular season. And, yeah, look, Mahomes was not the MVP in, in uh, 2019. He was in 2018, and he was still number four. Um, that, that, that It's probably more difficult to explain the 2018 voting than the 2019 voting when it comes to you know, Mahomes' place on the list. Yeah, so, and when you think, think about this. The top two players were Lamar Jackson and Russell Wilson. And throughout the 2019 regular season, we always heard – who are the top, you know, who's the MVP? And it always came down between Wilson two. and Jackson. So, you know, players yeah. are going to vote with what's being out there and what's being pushed. Yep. Aaron Donald came in number three, the, the Rams defensive tackle, and then Mahomes. And I, I did see a tweet from Mahomes on, on Wednesday night where he, you know, just a, just a little icon that said, or an emoji that said, note. Like he's taking notes. He noted that he was number four. And the significance of that to me is, I go back to the, the Monday night game in Chicago late in the season when when he scored was it after a rushing touchdown I can't remember but he he counted the 10 on his fingers right yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, to use a, a game of thrones reference the north remembers baby <laughs> <laughs> so i wouldn't be surprised if uh, if we see him count to 4 at some point in the 2020 season here's hoping that there is a 2020 football season. So, all right, Herbie, thanks for uh, stopping by, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Blair. Frank Huddle at the 5 of San Francisco. It's third down and goal. They trail by three, under three to go in the fourth quarter. Mahomes maneuvers Hill. Four wide, Mahomes in the gun, shotgun snap, fakes the handoff, rolls and throws a gentle pass. Caught with the leap at the five to the high line on the near side by Williams. Touchdown! He got in! 
The Chiefs have taken the lead in Super Bowl 54. Under center Mahomes, second down, six from the 38. Hand off to Williams, got a block from the fullback. He's at the 35, the 30, breaks a tackle on the sideline, 20. Chasing him down the sideline, the 10, the 5, touchdown! That's it! That's it! Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners. Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Lynn Worthy covers the Royals for the Kansas City Star. And Lynn, I was going to go a different direction to open our conversation until just a few minutes ago when I saw you tweet out that the Royals now have an opening day starting pitcher. I went to bed last night looking at the at the probable p- pitching matchups for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the, the Royals' uh, op- home opening series, and it said TBA on all of them. And when now we, at least we know Friday's opening day starter, and it is a bit of surprise. Tell us who it is. Yes, starting the home opener will be Chris Bubich, the left-hander, who hasn't pitched above high A. Um, He was in the Futures game last year along with Brady Singer. But he'll he'll make his big league debut and Friday night in the home opener for the Kansas City Royals. Yeah, but um, uh, everything about this season is unusual. Um, How have the Royals come to uh, a place where – that uh, a a second-year pro is going to start in what is always a a pretty high-profile game? Well, the, I mean, part of it is just attrition. <laughs> I mean, part of it. Exactly. And right. that's not, you know, that's not anything against, uh, you know, Bubich, but, um, but part of it's attrition where Brad Keller is still on the injured list. Jacob June is still on the injured list. Both of them had um, bouts with COVID that interrupted their spring training 2.0 or summer camp, whichever you want to call it. Um, and then earlier this week, Mike Montgomery was added to the injured list. Now this is a team that, going into spring training, the original spring training, had four starters, and normally you want five. So <laughs> that was right, right. there was already some, some you know, um, uh, a spot to fill, at least, you know, on paper. And um, now you've taken three of the four that you knew you had penciled in that you were counting on, and they're all out. And so, you know, you've added Brady Singer, another rookie, another one of their top draft picks from 2018, that draft class 2018 that's been talked about a lot and this has the four top picks for all pitchers and guys who are sort of knocking on the door, Bubich being one of them. Um, but uh, even with that, you've got Duffy and you've got Singer and then it's, you know, filling the rest. And yeah. as of today, Chris Bubich is going to be one of those guys who fills in right now. So, um, but yeah, they, I mean, they, they've gone with openers. They've, They've talked about uh, Ronald Melanios being the guy that they might that they've been trying to stretch out and have him start again because he started in the past. But um, then there was these you know these four guys who they drafted who were all highly thought of that the only one of them had been in the big league so far and um, so now we're starting to get to see number two and who knows before we see three and four. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I was reading Royals notes. Last night, as I was watching the the loss to the Tigers, and there's a note in there that uh, says that the Royals and the Pittsburgh Pirates have each used 18 pitchers this season, the most tied for the most in in baseball. And unless the Pirates use someone else last night, someone else new, or will use someone else tomorrow new, the the Royals will take the lead with uh, with Chris Bubich becoming at least the 19th. New arm to throw for the Royals this year. That's that's incredible. Uh, yeah, to have well, that many 
I was gonna say, is it only is it only a nineteen? <laughs> it, like, it seems like we've seen some everybody out there, but yeah, it's yeah. Uh, I, I believe it. I mean, um, and I I expect that number to keep growing. I mean, because there's you know with the with the roster still stretched out for at least another week. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you know we see some more guys, especially in the bullpen, and just with everything that's going on with the. Uh, I mean, well. And that number doesn't include the guys that you expect. And, you know, if you're the Royals, you hope are coming back with Keller and Junis. So. Right, right, exactly. Um, no, um, it is, um, it, it's been something. So, listen, I, I'm trying to, you know, the Royals uh, lost again last night to the Detroit Tigers. They finish up their uh, season opening seven game road trip uh, tonight against Detroit before the, the home opener Friday. And um, it, it's hard, it's difficult to, to draw conclusions, it seems to me, from the first six games. The, the previous two unfolded in, in disappointing fashion for the Royals, taking leads and, and losing those leads and, and having the offense really dry up in the last several innings of those games. They jumped, you know, they, they, they hit, the, you know, swung the bats well the first three or four innings each of the last couple nights. And then, and then, really could not battle back uh, against the Tigers bullpen in in those games. On on Tuesday night, you had the Whit Merrifield three run homer, and they end up losing four to three. And then, of course, last night they uh, they lose a four nothing lead pretty quickly, um, and and um, uh, and ended up dropping that game as well. What is um, uh, what does Mike Matheny say about the Royals' inability to close out these games? You know, it's it, it seems like it's. Um... It's not necessarily the same exact script, but it's similar scripts, at least the last couple of nights, like you said. Um, one being that, you know, they, they're they able to get out and score some runs early, and then they just can't hold on to the lead. I mean, I think, um, was it two nights ago? Uh, we're talking on Thursday, so I think it was two nights ago. Um, they had the lead for maybe an inning. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was, I, I, it was I, half I, I, an I, inning. I, yeah, it was yeah, half think, an inning. Merrifield had the three run homer in the top of the third, yeah. and then the Tigers came back with a pair of two run homers in the bottom. So, yeah. And so, and it's, you know, the, the thing that Matheny has talked about even before these last couple of games was the mistakes that, um, that they're, you know, that they're making as far as putting guys on base um, keep coming back to haunt them. And they, and I mean, and he, this is something that he was talking about at the beginning of spring training in Arizona, the free bases. I mean, I know he was, he's been talking about that, whether that's walk, whether that's hitting guys, whether that's errors. Um, and, and then, you know, a game or two into the season, I think it was, you already saw that, or actually it may be going back to the exhibition games where you saw that, you know, costing them runs multiple times. And then you see it into the season. And that, I know that's the thing that's, that frustrates him is that, you know, he's been talking about since as soon as basically he got the job, <laughs> you know, yeah. it was like, it was like, uh, you know, he got his introductory press conferences and then started talking about, we can't give up free bases. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was basically that, right. that quick for him. And then they, they've done it early in the season and they've paid for it just about each time. And that's, that's the thing that's most frustrating to him. Cause it's been, you know, it hasn't just been a home run. It's been, you put a guy on, you hit a batter and then you give up a two run home run. And then you do a walk and give up a two home, two run home run. So that's, that's the part that's frustrating on the uh, on the defense and pitching side um, because some of those have been errors too. There's been uh, in, in a, one of the previous games, I think the first couple of runs were unearned runs. I think Bolaño started the game where he gave up two runs, but they're both unearned. So, uh, and then offensively, they just for whatever reason haven't been able to sort of make hay when the bullpen comes in because um, you know bo- both teams have had to go to their bullpen pretty regularly, and for that matter, the, the Royals bullpen has been pretty well done, pretty well. I mean, last yeah. night Kennedy gave up that one home run, but I mean, you, you think about most of these games, they've all the scoring's been done early, and then it's just been bullpen shutting it down on both sides for the majority of the rest of the game. Um, so yeah, it's it's just been you know it's just been a frustrating in multiple levels to to start off this first week. Yeah, to your point, um, the the inning that that got Duffy in trouble, and Duffy had a fantastic start to the game, um, was, was terrific. But the inning that 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 got him was it, it started with a walk based on balls, and by the time the inning was over, the Royals had given up all of their lead, and and Duffy ended up on a night when it looked like he 
would um, you know would get a W and uh, get the game the way he was throwing the first couple three innings, get the game into the sixth or seventh. You know, he's he's out in the fifth, and uh, and it was a walk that started the the damage for him. So, um, hey, and on the flip side of that, I, the the Royals are uh, on the offensive side. They certainly have flexed their muscles, shown some power. Um, the the six home run game on I guess Monday in Detroit was phenomenal, tied a club record with uh, with six homers in a game, but. They're not taking walks. Their their on base percentage as a team is is really low, among the lowest in the American League. So, yeah, they've been they've been get, getting the ball over the wall, um, and and heck, couple three run homers even. But for the most part, it's not they're, they're not putting together rallies, right? It's not they're not having three and four hit innings, uh, or you know, throw in a walk or reach on an error sort of thing. They just you know they'll get a guy on, hit a home run, and look, nobody, nobody's you know sneezing at that. But it's um, they, they just don't seem to put together some of those keep the line moving rallies that uh, that the club was known for. And it seemed to and it seems to me that this lineup can be uh, adept at um, with uh, you know it, it's deeper than it was last year. And even though I, I do think they miss Hunter Dozier to make this lineup even deeper, they're they have the ability to string some hits together and some offense together, and it just doesn't seem to happen for them. Yeah, and they've they've shown little bits of it. I mean, like um, I think the other night, I don't remember if it was last night or the night before. I'm just starting to run together for me. I think it was. Yeah, it had to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they had they had a two run inning that was all on singles, if I remember correctly. I think it was. Um, they scored. Uh, it was the day they scored four runs in in the first. Uh, I think three or four innings. They they scored in the first three innings. It was one run, one run, and then two runs. And the two run inning, I think it was four singles. It was like a you know a Merrifield single. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was uh, Soler, and then you had you know an RBI single by somebody, an RBI single, and, and you know that's where the two runs came from. And then um, the other night before Franco's, I want to say second home run um, in the big inning. Um, they had, you know, uh, two guys on. They got the two outs, and then um, Ryan O'Hearn, his first game back, had an RB, a two-run single. And so, like, they've you've seen just a little bit of that, which you think you'd like to think that they could keep going. But then, especially when you talk about like the numbers for the season, you say on base and, and the strikeouts and everything. And that Cleveland series just really tipped yeah. those scales because they had the the two games where they were, I think it was like fifteen plus strikeouts in two of those games, and um, so it's. Uh, you know, like you, you think it's in there and you, you wonder if they have a full lineup in Dozier and stuff like that. But at the same time, this, this is the season of COVID. So I don't know if you're going to count on full lineups. You know? I mean, I don't, <laughs> uh, right. that just might not be. I mean, that's that's baseball in 2020. You might not have full lineups. I mean, you look around the league and that's that's the case for a lot of teams. But you, you'd think with a guy like Dozier in there and, you know, you lengthen that lineup. And we've seen and they've got a couple guys who are just ridiculously hot right now. And, and with Merrifield and, and um, Michael Franco. Um, so like when those guys come up you feel pretty confident that they're going to deliver in some way or another but um it's just they haven't pieced it quite together consistently enough and when they do they've you know been able to score runs right okay lynn let me ask you this you're um one of the only if not the only uh beat writer who's traveling who went on this op- season opening series to, to cleveland and detroit and and now the Royals are coming home uh for friday night to start a three-game series against the white Sox. i, I just want to know what um, how it's been, uh, is it, you know, pretty lonely in the, in the press box, I suspect. And there is no open clubhouse for you. Um, you know, no, no traffic getting to and from the ballpark cause there are no fans there. And I'm just wondering what the, just tell us, take us through covering a game in an empty ballpark. Well, it's, it's a, it's a very different experience than, than last season. I can say that, um, for one, I don't typically, at least, at least this year, I haven't typically gotten to the ballpark too early. On a on a regular season, you know, I'd get to the ballpark probably around by like three o'clock, four o'clock at the latest, depending on what time the clubhouse is going to be open. Because you'll get in, get settled in, you'll go down, meet with the manager. Clubhouse will be open. You'd be out there for batting practice. Um, you know, you get uh, when things close, the close the clubhouse and everything closes down for at least a good hour or so before the game, you get something to eat and then, you know, sort of get, get ready to go. Um, these days, because of the, at least the two stadiums we've been to so far, um, they're not doing, you know, uh, 
there's no open clubhouse. That's universal around baseball. But also, right. you know, you're not, um, you know, just frankly, they're not doing food and things like that. So I, I'm not going to get here, <laughs> get to the ballpark <laughs> three hours before the game and then sit there for three hours and not eat. So right. I typically go later so I can grab something and they let you bring it in with you. Um, so I go later, close to game time, bring myself something to eat and get in. And we do all our pregame, uh, the, the meetings that we would have, we do via Zoom with players and with the manager. So you can do that from a hotel room or from your home. Um, you don't have to be in the ballpark for that. Um, the I, I laughed a little bit when you said the press box is empty. Actually, in both of these parks so far, I haven't been in the press box. What they've oh. actually done is they've had, you know, I think um, these, uh, you know, the the, the the writers who've been who are traveling out of town with uh, you know a pandemic going on, they've sort of politely had us in a separate area, <laughs> in a suite. <laughs> usually, actually, what's been has been suites uh, in in Cleveland. It was actually a pretty nice suite. Uh, in Detroit, <laughs> not quite as nice, you know, but um, but in a separate area, not in the press box. It's in, basically right next to the press box where you're basically watching the game by yourself in uh, in a little room, you know. Um, off to the side. So so it's really been, I mean, I think in the first game in Cleveland, our columnist Sam Mellinger was there. So it was the two of us off, off in this little suite that's, you know, designed to have, I forget how many people, but uh, it's just the two of us. And then uh, the rest of the games, it was just myself. And then uh, in Detroit, it's been uh, just myself in the uh, suite um, overlooking the field. What an interesting scenario. Um, you know, you know, Never be like this again. Fingers crossed. You know, after after this year, so um, so we'll have a uh, some experience in Kansas City starting on Friday. Uh, we'll see how the Royals handle opening day and the, and home games here in Kaufman. The, I guess they're going to have the cardboard cutouts behind uh, behind home plate for you know for the TV cameras, and they'll pipe. In, I, I suppose they'll pipe in some crowd noise. We haven't. You've seen that both in Cleveland and Detroit. The the piped in crowd noise. Yep, yep, in both. And I think it's been a little different in both. Um, I've noticed, at least to my ears, in Detroit, it seems like they've upped the volume. They've sort of tried to make it feel more like a game in terms of when it's a full count and the opposing team's pitchers on the mound, they'll make it even louder, um, you know, as though the crowd was getting louder, to, you know, in anticipation of a big pitch or something like that. Um, and it seems like they've uh, the volume has gone up a little bit more when somebody on Detroit has made a, you know, gotten a big homer or something like that as opposed to the opposing team. Um, but yeah, it's been piped in both places. I don't, uh, there was a small section in Cleveland, I think that had some of the cutouts, not like what I've seen on TV or what, uh, the pictures I've seen of Kaufman. I think it's going to be a much fuller, um, uh, display in Kaufman. I was, I noticed today on Twitter, they even got made sure they put a, the buck on the old seats, got a cut, cut out of him. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> right. It is cool. <laughs> Very cool. All right, Lynn, uh, we will see you when you get back to town and uh, safe travels. Thank you. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Savannah Smith, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. Tip of the cap to Herbie Teope and to Lynn Worthy for talking about the Chiefs and the Royals. Links to stories by Herbie and Lynn can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about the Sports Pass offer. It still stands and still a good one. 30 bucks for a year's worth of sports coverage, and that includes the Sports Extra on the E-Edition. There are 49 additional pages of national sports coverage today. Well, here's an even better offer. Buy the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports, news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage. The details can be found at account dot kansascity.com slash subscribe that's account dot kansascity.com slash subscribe and whether it's the sports pass or the full subscription you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in kansas city and helping us produce programs like sports bkc thanks for listening we'll be back on friday with another episode (laughs) 